Hello and welcome everybody. We are at Charles Ritchie Senior Viewpoint here in beautiful West Seattle and we've got an amazing opportunity to view this great blue heron who's sitting right here. We always love it when we see these animals show up because it's our logo here at Harbor Wild Watch. So I actually kind of like to identify with this bird as I'm walking through the water looking for interesting things on a low tide. It's always great to see. Let me see if we can zoom in a little bit so you can really get a good view of this animal. So he's in about a foot of water right now looking for small tide pool fish, gunnels, little um, little flatfish flounders. And we've been watching him for about 10 minutes now. He's not been very successful, but he's made a couple of attempts. I'm looking for breakfast. If uh, those of you just tuning in wouldn't mind popping into the comments and letting us know where you're watching from. That's information we always like to know on this beautiful Sunday morning. There we go. And as always, I'm joined out here with Carly. <laughs> And of course, she's got her camera out because why wouldn't you with such great wildlife nearby? We've also got the infamous Jen from Seattle Aquarium. Say hi, Jen. Hey, <laughs> All right. Um, so we are partnering today with for this video with the Seattle Aquarium Beach Naturalists. Um, so Jen, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, about what you do there? And we are part of the community um, outreach section of the Seattle Aquarium. So we work a lot out in the field. And in the summertime, we are out here on our local beaches to educate people about what they're looking at on the beach and hopefully inspire some uh, marine conservation for all out on the beach. Perfect. It's like you've said that before. <laughs> And uh, there's, there's not many people out here on the beach today. We've got it largely to ourselves, which is kind of great. A little peaceful Sunday morning stroll down the beach. Um, and low tide today is about 1040 or so. So we've got some time before the tide goes out. But that doesn't mean there's not much to see right now. There's all kinds of life here. So we're looking, oh, Casey, yes. Um, Casey, you and I and Jen are kindred spirits. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain we are cut from the same cloth. We are enjoying finding our careers in marine biology and teaching people about these amazing places. Oh, you guys, Hi, there are so many cool things in this tiny, tiny pool. Can you see this little teeny tiny alien-like creature? This is a skeleton shrimp or caprellid and they are super super cool you have to have really good eyesight to spy them there's also lots of plankton in the water i'm noticing lots of amphipods copepods oh here's a cool find i'm just taking a look into one of these small water depressions to see what kind of creatures are here and the slower you go the more that you'll notice so we're seeing more of these little shrimp here as they kind of wiggle their way around the tide pool. There's a hermit crab over here hanging out in a broken off snail shell. There are some little green Sitka shrimp. There is a lot of life just right here. And I imagine we're going to see even more. Oh yeah. Tell us about this creature. So this is um, this is a rough pitted clam and they're, we're in their neighborhood. They love to live in this clay sediment area and they have these specialized shells with ridges on the bottom and they use them to twist themselves and dig a home for themselves in harder clay and rock and then that's kind of where they're going to stay put for the rest of their yeah. life. Here's an see. even larger yeah. one. Get a good view of their siphon which is the only part that's visible. You see those two holes? One pulls water in and one squirts water out. In current and ex current siphons. So cool. I always can tell this clam apart from say a gooey duck or a horse clam by those really fine, they got these great serrations on this side. And this one's a little one, but they do get pretty good size. Yeah, this one over here is, yeah, this is, this one's pretty big this is a pretty big one here. 
so great to see. And these are filter feeders. So they're, they're pulling in uh, lots of plankton from the environment around them. And they're a species that we wanna be uh, careful about with regard to our water quality. Because if the water out here is polluted, if there's dog poop or oil or fertilizer in it, the clams can't choose what they eat. They kind of are subject to whatever's in the water around them. And so they are a species that can take on an extra amount of pollution. Um, here's a really cool find. Mm -hmm. This is one of the animals we get asked about the most. Um, what are those brown blobs on the underside of rocks? What are those big hangy uh, loogie looking like creatures? the big hangy balls of snot. This is a plumose anemone. And when it's underwater, it's insanely gorgeous. They have these great frilled tentacles that they reach out. They're also plankton eaters. And I'm noticing right next to it, there is a dog winkle snail. Super cool to see. What have you got over here? I'm just looking at this clamshell that is uh, now a home. Oh yeah, that's become habitat for sure. For all kinds of things. We've got some ova, sea lettuce, and we've got barnacles and little limpets all making their, there's a little, there's a little Oh, so tiny. For a hermit crab. This is one, this is a really good example of why I like to leave shells on the beach because they end up becoming homes for so many other animals. Yeah, always a great lesson. It's really hard to find a shell in this habitat that isn't colonized by some encrusting organism or being used for shelter um, by something else. Here's a good look at some of this rock here. Um, you see these holes, these round holes? Those are most likely carved out by those pitic clams. You can see here, this channels here, those would be where uh, lots of pittocks would be living. Um, and you always have to be careful when you're walking along a beach like this because you will get squirted uh, by a pittock here and there. I'm actually listening for a lot of animals. It's quiet enough out here that you can hear, say, a crab or a fish moving. Ooh, that's a great find. Yeah, I really love all the different types of, of sea lettuce that we have. And I I think this one is the Ulva intestinalis. I think so too. Looking like very much like an intestine next to <laughs> some other Ulva that is more of a yeah. The blade more of a flat is blade. more. Oh, and hey, hey there, little buddy. We've got a hermit crab hanging out here, showing off how they use shells, and his shells become food or a habitat for other animals as well. We've got some barnacles on there. A little bit of encrusting algae as well. Got some cool stuff up here too. Not only do we have another one of those little cup prowlids, but we also have a, have a moon glow. I think this one's a moon glow anemone yeah. down here, just tucked into the sand, tucking in all its tentacles. So it's gonna keep itself nice and moist as the tide is out. We can cover it back up with a little yeah. seaweed him, to keep it. Give them a little out. umbrella shade. That's one of the, great things about this ulva lettuce, sea lettuce, is it's everywhere and it does kind of ward off the desiccation. It helps a lot of animals stay moist and itself can dry out completely. It'll be totally uh, dry as a piece of paper and then when the tide comes back in it liquefies again and rehydrates and goes on photosynthesizing. It's a great cool species of algae. There's also these great red algaes here lots of them forming kind of this crest. Here's a cool, this one underwater looks really amazing. Um, it looks like these ropes of hair, green hair. There's, another, there's so much. Oh here. yeah, there's a lot right here. It's a nice, uh, this is a northern feather duster tube worm and they make these beautiful parchment homes and they use uh, mucus. It's really important to so many things on the beach <laughs> and this worm definitely uses mucus to help build its tube. And when they are under the water, they are just so beautiful. They look like blooming flowers with this head of tentacles that are used for feeding and respiration that are red and green. Oh, and check out what Ooh, Carly yeah. found. A different type of tube worm over here. Ooh, plus a little. <laughs> oh, and a little amphipod. A little amphipod growling around. This one's unfortunately broken. This is a bamboo. Yep, tube worm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good job, Carly. <laughs> they long and oh, yeah, and they stretch dense. and not yep, yeah, uh, not attached. But in comparison. Yeah. Um, and this is about maximum size for both of those species. 
the, these guys get long, really long. I've seen them up to about 22 inches long, mm -hmm. but um, only off of a dock in a place that's permanently underwater. In the intertidal zone, they're short and stubby like this. Yeah. Almost always. All right, well, let's, gosh, we're finding a lot here, but let's walk along. Um, this beach is really fantastic because it's got a variety of substrates. So we've got this kind of bedrock here, and you can see the scrapes really made by the glaciers during the ice age. Then we've got sand and cobble, and then there's rocks, and ooh, there's something kind of neat tucked in here. There is a red rock crab. This is a female red rock crab. And I can tell that without even seeing her abdomen by how domed her top carapace is. So males are slightly more flat overall, but we're gonna leave her be. She's got a great little hiding spot right here. Well, just kind of tuck her in, save her from the seagulls and the crows are out in force today. Lots and lots of birds taking advantage of the dinner table here. Oh, that's my favorite. Oh, it seems kind of rare to see it at this time of year. Yeah, this time of year, they, this is usually pretty well eaten. Um, this is red eyelet silk, one of my favorite algaes. But it looks like this one also, besides being able to see yeah, it's that got it's holding other on, stuff. but it's got some epiphytic other red seaweed living on it. Yeah, red seaweed is loves to live on other seaweeds. Um, and you don't really typically see that with the brown algae. Green does it occasionally, but I think green's more, um, they'll just live on anything, anywhere they can. We've got, we're getting down now into the lower tide where we see some great kelps and these really, really pretty finely branched red algaes. Look at that. That's a really pretty one. So nice to see. Oh yeah, that's... Looking at the sugar kelp and the bryzoan that are living on here. Yesterday I was looking at some of these and I found some little tiny cryptic nudibranchs that oh, like to yes. live on here. I need these. I'm not seeing any on this one, but we'll keep looking. We'll keep looking. Them. And yeah. once you find them, you, you become obsessed with finding more of them, it seems. I Now that I, I see, know. every time I see <laughs> kelp bryzoans, I'm like, oh, look for the nudies. <laughs> um, for those of you just turning in, we're at Charles Ritchie Senior uh, Park. It's a really nice viewpoint here in West Seattle. And we're just enjoying the amazing day that we've got. Um, if you've got questions, go ahead and pop them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer those. Let's see what else we can find here. Walking right along the edge of the shore is a good way um, to see animals that may be leaving during low tide. Um, a lot of the more mobile creatures will chase the tide out. Oh, look at that. It's so pretty. Pretty in the, yeah, pretty in the sunlight. Um, here's another pittock siphon. More of those guys. Oh, that's a cool find. I was just coming to look at that. So, so this is living on this sargassum, right? It's attached itself, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not quite sure if, what species this is. Do you know? Um, I call it sea cauliflower, but, um, I'm trying to think of what the actual name of it is. Um, they like get really big yeah. in some places. Like I've seen them as big as a grapefruit. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, out in Port Orchard. Oyster, oh, oyster, oyster thief. thief. Yep, right? that is That's totally it, oyster yeah. thief. Thank you. Oh. That is what it is because it does grow on oyster shells really readily and it chokes out their ability oh. to filter feed. Oh, yeah, look at the size of those. That one and that one over there. Lots, lots of siphon action here. <laughs> oh, and a great moon glow anemone their feeding tentacles still out and as the tide goes out that'll withdraw here's another one here they get kind of peachy green um, which is just beautiful to see um, you really have to on a beach like this you really have to choose where you put your feet carefully so that we're not crunching any innocent animals um, and we're gonna navigate we're we're into an eelgrass bed now Really, really important habitat for tons and tons of species here in the Salish Sea. Um, so we're going to use a lot of care walking through here. We try not to disturb the eelgrass beds. They're pretty sensitive habitat. So we don't want to crush. Okay. Are you agreeing with me or contradicting me, Seagull? <laughs> I'm going to say agreeing with. He's like, hey, don't mess with my feeding ground. 
Um, so we'll just walk carefully. There are little bear patches where we can kind of step to avoid, um, avoid this. This is a true plant. So all those algaes that we were showing you before don't have tissues like the eel grass does. This has roots and stems and leaves and even flowers. And there are tons of animals that will grow and um, kind of hang out on it. It's also a really important habitat for um, prevention of erosion. So this really slows down the force of large waves and holds on to this sediment, this really nutrient rich, all the stuff that's making this hazy, this uh, detritus. And it'll kind of provide it and keep those nutrients here in this habitat rather than letting them get scoured out by big waves. And they're like, I wish we could shrink you down um, and let you walk through this like a forest because there's tons of life that is microscopic that lives in the eelgrass beds. And here's another one of those red algaes that likes to grow on things. This algae on the sides of this eelgrass only grows on eelgrass. And that's as big as it gets. Super cool. Eelgrass is also uh, really important for seasonal salmon. Oh yeah, good point. It's a crucial part of our ecosystem here. So it's another reason to take care of walking around it, finding the bare patches. Ooh, what are you eating, seagull? He just found lunch found himself some lunch. I always like to watch the birds because oftentimes they will find things um, quicker than we can find them. They've got really great eyesight. And so sometimes you'll find the gulls discover something really amazing and interesting like this. <laughs> Here we've got the remains of a red rock crab. So evidence that somebody got eaten here. You can see the clams squirting everywhere. Oh, and Jen, you found one of the cool things I was hoping we would see today. Yeah, yeah this is a, a moon snail egg caller. And I bet you a lot of people that are watching already know what this is like. And we have a little buddy. Oh, hey there. Uh, <laughs> that was taking some shelter underneath. Look, he, watch, he's just gonna bury straight down into the sand. We don't see you anymore. Like, what crab? I don't know what you're talking about. And this is a great way to show off the adaptation that crabs have of having their eyes and antenna right at the top of their carapace. That they could, oh wow, he went all the way under. <laughs> a little, little shimmy into the sand there. What crab? Um, yeah, so they can kind of bury themselves down and then poke just their eyes and their antenna up out, uh, which is really cool. Okay, but back to this thing. And anyway, so this is from, <laughs> this is, these, are this, these are the eggs of a, a Lewis's moon snail, and they are the biggest marine snail. They live in our area. We have a lot of the biggest of yeah. in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> but this is made out of sand and eggs and, of course, mucus. Mucus, because you know, there's a lot of mucus at the beach. And this, um, there can be about half a million eggs inside of each of these. And one thing I always like to do when I find them too is to yeah, look, look underneath. on the side. And this one doesn't have too much going on on the underside. Little bamboo tube worm bit, but I see there's little, maybe some maybe little a snails snail. um, going on underneath here. But sometimes we find nudibranchs under here. Um, baby crabs. sea stars. The baby mottled stars really like those in the springtime. Yep, baby stars. Um, uh, there's a little looks like a little amphipod in there. And I was telling Rachel that I saw one yesterday that had a, a, a painted anemone attached to it. Which is weird, but weird. cool. Cool to see. <laughs> um, we'll probably likely also see other evidence of moon snails. I always like to look at the, at the clams to see if they have that mark. And this one, this butter clam shell doesn't have it. But we'll keep looking. I won't be surprised. Oh, and we've got everyone's favorite naturalist, Miss Stina, is joining us here. So we'll, we'll put her e We already, yeah, we already fangirled about meeting our kindred spirit. <laughs> we will beach curtsy at each other. <laughs> Super great. Uh, it's always fun to, to, you know, meet people that you've been connected with through social media, but haven't actually ever met in person. So. It's an exciting day. So we'll enlist Stina's eagle eyes to see uh, what we can see here at this habitat. Now we've changed almost fully over to sand where we were on the bedrock before and then kind of in the mixture where the gravel was now we're on to really fine sediments sands and this is a great place for other species of clams oh, and lots of baby fish um, little tide pools sculpin and gunnels 
will hug the shoreline as the tide goes out because the predators aren't going to come close. Ooh, what'd you see? What'd you see? Something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, like, yeah, zoom yeah. in on that guy, but this really camouflaged in there with yeah. all of the... Um, Let's see if I can just hold him still from not moving for a second. Um, there, this is a kelp isopod, <laughs> and there he goes. Um, what I love about them is when they swim. Um, yeah. is they swim upside down with their belly flaps up, um, and they just kind of shake their belly. Backstroke. Backstroke, yeah, exactly. The isopod backstroke. All right, let's see. Yeah, lots of pinnocks here. Lots of, um, we're starting to see more and more of those tube worms. Um, Ooh. Oh, yeah. Is that a Krangen, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, it's a Krangen or sand term. They like crabs and they molt their shells. Nice. That's, those don't last very long on the beach, no. so that's a cool thing to find. A really long antenna. Yeah. Yeah, shrimp and hermit crabs have really long antennas, whereas crabs have really short ones, um, like we saw in that red rock crab. Um, and that's, that's purely a, a habitat thing. The crabs can bury down into the ground. They're nice and short and squat. Um, and having long antennas, they'd probably get broken off. Um, but the shrimp and hermit crabs are more mobile and they more uh, in deeper water. So they, they tend to keep theirs nice and long. They also can feel behind their long bodies where a crab can see behind their body. Anything interesting over here? Oh, super tiny little uh, crab molt. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just the tiniest little molt. We'll probably see some more molts because during the spring and summer is when uh, our crabs are molting the most. And so they're, they've got to shed their skin to be able to grow. Maybe you can, um crab molting. Oh, sure. So we, we were noticing one day that all the crab molts we found were males oh. and that we didn't see any females. And we're thinking maybe that is an adaptation so that the males will be not in a soft state when the females are in a soft state because they have these Yes. That so that true. I don't know for certain that that's true, but okay. I do know that crab reproduction can only happen when the females have, uh, well, at least in the big, bigger crab species like the Dungeness and the red rock crabs, they can only m mate when the female is soft. So she'll molt, um, and oftentimes the males will find the females before they molt and hold on to them and carry them around until they're ready. And then afterwards, they'll hold on to her as long as there's not another female crab around. Um, so they'll kind of protect the female. And imagine that if they're soft shelled at the same time, they wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a interesting observation. Uh, I'm on board with your theory. What'd you find? Oh yeah, they're everywhere. Just stop and look. They're everywhere. These skeleton shrimp. I've never seen those before. They are super, super cool. Um, and they anchor with six feet at the bottom of their abdomen and then they reach kind of upwards and they almost look like a mantis shrimp. They do have these like claws uh, that come out. Here's another. Every once in a while, you can find a female. A big female with dropping. eggs, yeah. yeah and, and the eggs are, um, they're really conspicuous because it's like a little stick that's pregnant, right? So they're <laughs> really tiny and then they have this big bulge where they're... Oh, did you find one? Yeah, it's very My favorite big. is... Oh, can you see? Cool, yeah. They are inspiration for... Oh, yeah, the, the movie Predator, Alien. I think. Yeah, or Alien. Alien, I think <laughs> it is. Because close up, they look terrifying. Yeah. And so amphipods, um, so we saw the kelp isopod. They have iso is the same, so many same feet. Amphipods have many different feet. So you have the one clinging to the steel grass. And then the... Set. You have like a grasping food set. You have a swimming set. I don't know exactly. Wow. There's <laughs> yeah, all sorts there's, of different legs. There's a variety of, of legs. Versus the amphipods, which, oh, here's a good... Here's a puddle where they're all kind of stuck oh. in this puddle. Um, and you can see, gosh, they are everywhere. Yeah. So I typically see these um, in places where you get like filamentous algae. So like this filamentous algae here really camouflages them. And when they're underwater, they'll just anchor their feet and kind of reach out and grab really, really cool, oh cool things to see. The tiniest yeah, gosh, you've got to Oh my them. gosh. Whoa. Everywhere in here. So Oh, did you find a yeah, Krangen? Tiny. 
Oh my gosh, Tina, how am I gonna focus on that? <laughs> that is the cutest thing. It is <laughs> super cute. More pitted clams here in this sandy environment. They do well in the rocks and the sand. So you were, you were saying that the propellants are amphipods? Yeah, they are. Um, they are a type of amphipod. Do you, do you all do the, um, the secret naturalist handshake to help you remember? Uh, what? No. What is it? <laughs> I do not know the secret oh, naturalist yeah, hand. Really a hand. It's called a handshake, right? So All right, let's have, let's see. We have isopods, right? Body shape. Amphipods. Oh yeah. And pooperpods. Ah. Right? <laughs> That's where it should be more like a natural greeting. Yeah, there you yeah. go. I love it. It's that almost like a rock paper scissors. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Which one? They probably all eat each other. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. I love it. All right, I'm gonna move up the beach a little bit because we have another transition zone here. So we've got eelgrass down in here. Um, so I wonder what these could be. <laughs> Should we explore? What could be in here? Maybe put your guess in the comments what you think these weird little sand donuts might be caused by. Oh, and <laughs> check this out. This is where you can look at the, the sand and see patterns these are crab crab footprints um, but if we look carefully we should, <laughs> should see <laughs> that that's a clam <laughs> you guys you guys ready <laughs> i'm not ready i don't think we just try to move off the top of him there we go <laughs> now unfortunately i can't tell what kind of clam that is because he went down too quickly but Ooh, more evidence of animals, more footprints here. Some predators Whoa. hanging out on the beach. Oh, here's more animal evidence. My favorite. <laughs> Poop. Yeah. I was just looking at some of that, like in all these little um, crab holes. Oh yeah, look, there's a bunch. Their poop. It's right filled there. with poop. Little... Yay, clam poop. Hole. <laughs> I'm gonna get a vulgar. I'm, am I gonna get a uh -oh. vulgar warning? Yeah. I was on TikTok yesterday doing a live video to all of our crazy amount of fans. There's 40,000 followers on TikTok. And I got banned for talking about barnacles and their reproductive means. Here's a cool creature. I mean, I guess it's vulgar, but the animals can't help it. Here we've got this really cool um, chitin. This is a woody chitin. If you can kind of take the sand away from him, you can kind of see they have these eight plates along their body. There are more. So here's a typical Pittock clam in this bedrock. There's a crab inside this one. Hard to focus on, sorry. Carly doing what she does, squatting in the photographer's pose. Oh, a perfectly posed anemone, I love it. Nice. Uh... Turkish Ooh, that's pretty. with some iridescence going on. It's so pretty. So pretty. Sina, what are you finding in the rockweed? Uh, oh yeah, moon glows. The body is normally buried in the sand, I guess. Oh yeah, yep. So yeah, seeing this There's little, I almost thought it was a jelly. Oh and yeah. I was like, it's stuck to the rock. It's a moon glow button. There's tentacles. Or mouth, I mean, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool to see the body of um, yeah, this is really excellent habitat. We've got a wide variety of substrates and probably um, some changes that correspond to the different flows of water here. As the waves may crash in some places and be more gentle in other places. The eelgrass beds help slow down that, that kelp. This one. Oh, that's a different does one. That, does that look like something happened to it to you? Oh, yeah. Maybe Somebody. a red rock crab? <laughs> Somebody I got into there. Off. Yeah, okay. freshly broken shell. Probably is definitely a predator mm -hmm. for sure. Here's another one of those plumos anemones. Super great to see those guys. Oh, and here's more moon glows that are out. This is a moon glow anemone. They're pretty peach tentacles. And they love to be right in the sand. Oh, there's a caprella shrimp. Little skeleton shrimp right on him. I don't 
know if he's gonna be lunch or if he's gonna make it out of there. But I have seen anemones eat things quite large, like unbelievably large. I've seen a, a kelp crab get eaten by an aggregating anemone before. Yeah, it was like, I found it half digested and yeah, hanging out of the mouth. It was amazing to see. Uh, yeah. yeah, aren't they beautiful? They're so pretty. So we only really see these Mungal anemones at um, the Fox Island Bridge. Well, this one's interesting because it's got more of like a peachy tentacle. So then yeah, I'm compared like, to the pinky one. A... That one has the stripes on the tentacles. This one does. I don't. Oh know. yeah, I he does. Know what this one is? I guess. I He's think not, aggregating, but not it's like real not stupid. really pink enough. <laughs> oh yeah, no, you're okay. So many good things to look at. If there's anything you guys are hoping that we find today, go ahead and pop that in the comments. We always like to know what you want us uh, to look at and see. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful thing to show. Oh, that is a big one. Wow. Yeah, and if you're just joining us, we are out at Charles uh, Ritchie Point um, in West Seattle. We're kind of just south of Alki. Uh, and there's some great, the orange on the rocks there is bryozoans, which are little moss animals. Um, and we've gotten into a patch of this sargassum weed here. Um, and sargassum tends to attract all kinds of animals like this little hidden just come up to the top so we can see you friend um this is a, a graceful kelp crab doing an excellent job of camouflage mm -hmm. if he wasn't moving you would never see that crab there is that awesome to see so we'll leave him in the water and let him go back down to hide oh yeah I love the Sitka shrimp. They're so fast. They're bright green usually because they love to... Oh, here's another. This one is the northern kelp crab. Not quite the same as the one we just saw. But also can be a decorator, especially on their nose. They like to disguise their top of their rostrum. Um, this is really, really good habitat for lots of cryptic species. So that means animals that like to camouflage and blend in. Um, there's lots of, um, there's some, some hydroids on these. Uh, oh yeah, those kind of lighter, sargassum. lighter tips are hydroids. And there's a little teeny tiny uh, nudibranch that loves, I'm not seeing any yeah, on this bunch. Hopeful. The, I hope I'm we see one. Them, but they love to live, they eat the hydroids and they lay their eggs on them. Have you ever seen those, Rachel? Uh, yeah, moon, yeah. Um, you got, no, we haven't so, found one yet. Right over here is another one of those kelp isopods. Let's see if I can point them out to you. They just zoom so quickly. They're really hard to hard to keep track of. Um, oh, isn't that one huge? Here's another little hermit hanging out, crawling around. It must be hard to carry their big shell up <laughs> up yeah. into the water column. Um, Oh, look at that. Oh, there's, there's, and there's a stubby rose. Yeah, a little right? rose anemone right there. And then, oh, look at yeah. how pretty that is. Hard to focus on, but beautiful. Um, and these anemones are carnivores. So they're out here capturing whatever animals they can find, be it shrimp or fish, crabs. Oh yeah, that, that Christmas one is huge. Oh, it's a little medium. Oh, and there's the, and yeah, that's a plumos the right there. So that big brown one that we saw earlier that just looked like a little ball of snot, this is what they look like underwater. They have these really feathery tentacles. They have very teeny tiny nematocysts, so they're not, they're not going after the big stuff. Yeah, those bright zones. Yeah. So pretty. Oh, yeah, that's somebody. Oh, else. look, there's a chitin under there. A beautiful oh, yeah. blind chitin. Blind chitin. And then a woody chitin. Oh uh, yeah, it looks like yeah. it. Wow. Oh, so pretty. 
Got a lot of variety of life just on this one rock. Oh, and these are some nudibranchi eggs. Yeah, those are some opalescent nudibranchi eggs. Oh, so cool. There, yeah, that means there's one somewhere. Um, it's always kind of good to slowly creep around and look. There's another chitin there. That one's moving a little bit. You don't usually see them moving during low tide. They kind of just sit during the daylight hours and they move around mostly at night when there's less, less happening. Lots of hermit crabs in the Sargassum, which is surprising to me. These guys hanging out. You not usually see them in there? No. They're they, in your apartment? They're, yeah, down <laughs> south, they haven't figured out how to climb. Uh, this is a hairy hermit. And they generally pick shells that are too small for them so that they can be speedy and fast. Um, and probably also so they can climb up like this into the sargassum chasing down food. Now, I can't tell if this is plankton in the water or just poop. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> Both. Both, yeah, a little of everything. All mixed together. Steve's always finding dove snails. Oh, and a nudie. Oh, there it is. There's an opalescent nudie. There we want. Oh, yeah. Don't pick him up, but let's just look close and see. Oh, you can see that buddy. bright line. Oh yeah, he's so pretty. So nice. They are carnivorous slugs that crawl around looking for usually a lot of cnidarians to eat. So they're eating things like anemones and hydroids. And they don't live for very long, just a couple of months. And so during the summer, we see them generally be, they're a little bit bigger. In the winter time, they're a little smaller because there's less food available and times are tough in the winter. We are diving at Los Davis last Friday and they're just like everywhere in the eelgrass. Wow. Oh my goodness. So great to see. We, I think it's generally, um, I don't think I've ever met a marine biologist who wasn't obsessed with nudibranchs. So um, they're, they're quite popular. Beautiful slugs. Snails. Oh yeah. Stina's always loving the <laughs> dove snails because they wiggle. They wiggle their little foot. I love it. All right, let's 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 keep walking. We're getting a little bit more eelgrass. Our tide is still going out. Hasn't quite changed yet, so we may still see some of the more elusive creatures that like to hang out down in the lower tidal heights. Things like moon snails or even octopus can be spotted on a really, really low tide. more anemones on these little rocks. You can see the anemones tend, if they're not down in the sand like the moon glows, they tend to favor the larger rocks that aren't gonna move around. And they'll just hang out here during low tide. They kind of close up or dangle. Sometimes they just hang down. Gravity's not really very kind to anemones during low tide. Yeah, it's got a real Noctiluca-esque look to it. Yeah. So what we're talking about is this kind of orangey stuff in the water. It looks like it could be um, a bioluminescent plankton called Noctiluca, and it's um, it glows blue at night. I mean, it glows blue during the day too. You just can't notice. Okay, this drives me crazy because I always get really excited when I see something like this and I'm like, oh, look at it. And I'm like, oh, it's an apple. Oh, it's a tomato. Oh, a strawberry. Um, I think it's an apple. <laughs> apple or tomato. Oh, look at this. Lined chitin. Yeah, orange peels. Get me super excited. Because there's an orange peel nudibranch that looks just like them. Um, here's a beautiful lined chitin here. Got right Great orange sherbet colored lines, a bunch of little tiny limpets. And then of course there's barnacles on the rocks. Whenever you see this right here, this is the scars of barnacles where the barnacles were living. And I love showing this off right here because you can see what overcrowding does. So normally they would have a round 
kind of shape. But when you settle a little too close to your neighbor, you gotta kind of grow into whatever shape is there. And then they also tend to get taller. So they kind of take on their kind of skyscraper-esque as they grow. Hummocking. Hummocking, yeah, there's a technical term for it. I like skyscrapering. I like skyscrapering. <laughs> it's a little more descriptive. Urban barnacles. Yeah, urban barnacles. Yeah, that's right, we are in They're Seattle. Rural barnacles, <laughs> urban barnacles. Yeah, there you go. So this is what they should look like <laughs> when they're alive. Round, plenty of room to spread out and grow. And then they get a little too tall when it gets how crowded. Like, how the tiny muscles have their little fuzz berries. Oh, yeah. Oh, they got a little fuzz to them? Yeah. Technical term. <laughs> um, I'm interested in looking at these big rocks up here. So let's go that way. I'm in charge of the camera, so I got to go wherever, wherever I want to go. Um, the, here are some aggregating anemones. So you can see how these are a little different than the... The moon glows they have this kind of it's called the column and it's greenish um and they get their name because they do this they aggregate and they're everywhere um oh this is perfect habitat i would imagine for chitons how are you you are look at that i have like a knack for finding the hidden chitons and um, believe it or not this is an animal right here <laughs> i love that <laughs> This blob right here, you're gonna trust me. It's a living creature that's really cool. Um, now this is very treacherous going. I'm gonna do my best to walk on bare rocks because I don't wanna squish any of these. Yeah, <laughs> just carefully choose. I can step on the rocks um, as long as I look like they're not gonna roll over on me. Uh, here we go, here's some cool. Those feather duster tube worm tubes all living together. And there's a lot of them here. There's some larger barnacles. These are thatched barnacles, I think. And you can hear yeah. <laughs> all the snap, crackle, and popping of barnacles moving inside their shells, as well as small crabs and things like that. There is life on every square inch. So even here, where the barnacles died, Check it out, there's new baby barnacles, like way too many of them. They won't all survive. Barnacles have it rough. They never get to move from their spot. Oh, here's a cool find. This is a snail. And he's got just a little bit of an orange tinge to his shell, which is kind of pretty. Sometimes you find them, they're like bright, like traffic cone orange. Yeah, yeah. That's cool to see. A a combo. A combo. Oh, and you know me, I love seeing this cool al algae. It's so loud over here. Right? Yeah. It is. <laughs> I don't know that my phone microphone is strong enough to pick this up, but it really it's does singing. smell like, or smell, sound like uh, tube worms. It's hard See? Like, smell <laughs> Ooh, here's a cool <laughs> find. Um, right in here, tucked in here is this beautiful purple sponge, which is an animal. A lot of people don't really realize that, but sponges are animals. They're one of the most basic creatures out there. Um, some scientists have even put them through a blender and they have assembled, reassembled after that. Not many animals you can put through a blender and survive to tell the tale. Um, but they are filter feeders as well. So those holes that you see, the osculums are where they pull water through their whole body and then it come out through those and they kind of create their own little current around them instead of um, a, waiting for the water current to bring them food they they kind of pull water into them the oh a moving chitin let me carefully oh, get to you oh yeah this look at you. a mossy chitin and i i don't know about you but it's taking oh, me a long time oh he is moving look at him He's got an anemone on him. I know, he's got an anemone and he's, look at that. Fancy. Yeah, the difference, you were going to say the yeah, difference between mossy, mossies and hairy. hairies. <laughs> right, mossy, hairy, and woody. woody. Right, but I always have to remember that it's the opposite it's the, of what you think. Yes, because cause hair think, is longer than moss. Right. Yes, it's the opposite of what you think. It yes. drives me crazy. Mossy is the hairy. Who is in charge of naming these chitons? <laughs> um, I love to point out to people that chiton is spelled with a C-H. 
um, but pronounced with a hard K. And it's kind of like chlorine, right? That's spelled with a CH, but uh, we say with a K sound. Science is weird. Oh yeah, here's a piece of... Yes, the inside of chitin shells is this pretty blue color, but it doesn't last. Um, it fades pretty quickly once the animal's dead. But yeah, he's just slowly turning. He's got an anemone on one of his plates. Totally camouflage. I mean, if you if you didn't know that was an animal, it would take some convincing. Uh, here's something That's kind of. Osprey. Oh yeah. Osprey. Just Ooh, hey, something. Osprey. I was hoping you were gonna say orca, but <laughs> oh, hey, there's an orca. Ah, <laughs> oh, spray is just as good, I guess. Um, but here's the underside of one of these thatched barnacles. So you can see the shell, different portions of them, and then the outside of their shell becomes home for more barnacles. And then the underside, kind of cool. Um, the thatched barnacles are my favorite. They're they're so pretty. Um, Okay, going again. Who's going again? Oh! Look at that! There you go, there's your Seahawk. Yeah. <laughs> the Seattle Seahawks, uh, in effect. Ospreys. The seagulls do not dive quite as. No, the sea seagulls dive, but they're a little too buoyant. Super cool. All right, now let me try to zoom out, I guess, a little bit. Hard to do on my phone here. Sorry, I apologize for the quality of the video as I try to sort, sort out my zoom here. There we go, we figured it out. All right, so let's just keep walking. There's so many of these really cool big barnacles really stand out amongst the rest. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if the other one you're looking at. Oh yeah. Just look at how that barnacle just grew straight up like that compared to the other ones on there. They're all squat. There must have been a whole bunch of rounds. He got there first. Or <laughs> <laughs> he just bullied the rest of them. Uh, that does happen too. Competition is fierce. I mean when space is at a premium here it's really hard to carve out a living for yourself if your neighbors are also trying to outcompete you. Um, so the ones that are best at securing a spot are the ones that are gonna survive. Or they're gonna switch things up and live in less desirable neighborhoods. That's like true. The high inner tidal like is a hard place to live. But if you can if you can do it, then you can be successful. Not on a dock, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's so cool to see. They're so pretty when they come out underwater. I like to come to this area when it's not quite a super low tide so I can So you see can see see more of the animals in their mm -hmm. like in their normal state. Yep. The low tide is really the survival state for many animals. It's higher temperatures, it gets hot, it's windy so they dry out. Uh, they get sunburned and then there's things like human beings and herons and crows that come down during this time yeah right we've got lots lots of more predator interaction at at high tide or excuse me at low tide than there is at high tide the high tide is when they got to worry about the aquatic predators and stuff swimming out there that's going to come up and take advantage of this habitat for feeding Yeah, aren't they so cute? Different shell shape. More different strategies. They're sort of me more reinforced. Oh, it's and it's feeding. And it's waving. Hello. Oh, I mean feeding. Kicking. Kicking. <laughs> Can you wave if you don't have hands and you only have feet? Sure. Why not? Oh, I'm interested to go look at this big rock over here. Oh, here. Wait. 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 Here's a dewworm that's out. Um, so you can see the color and see how they're moving. Oh, and then they go right back in. So that's a predator response. Typically, when they're underwater, 
they are a worm. They're delicious. All kinds of fish would love to eat them. Um, and so when they're touched, they jump back in their, their parchment tube so they're protected and then come right back out when the coast is clear. All right, so I'm going to carefully walk on over to this big rock. This looks to me like a glacial erratic rock, which is left behind by glaciers during the Ice Age. Anytime you see a really big rock that's kind of out of place, typically it's an erratic. Not always. People like to move rocks around too. Uh, like over there is a bunch of riprap. Um, kind of foundational rock that gets placed places where you want to build structures. There's one big permanent rock here. Lots of barnacles. Oh gosh, almost nothing but barnacles and a couple of limpets on there. little pool. Still lots of shrimp and things like that in there. Let's go out a little deeper. We're getting down to the point of the low tide, so we should start to see more interesting things. There's plenty of tube worms out here. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm a huge fan of these beautiful red algaes. It's just so beautiful. They're so pretty. Let's see what else we've got. Go follow Jen. She knows this beach pretty well. Um, here's a good, a good view of this sea lettuce so you can see what it looks like underwater. It's really beautiful. It's only one or two cells thick so it's pretty translucent. You can see right through it. And if it breaks apart, it'll just continue to live. Um, and sometimes it gets washed way up high on the beach um, and it can survive that. It's really well adapted to this inner tidal life of high tide, low tide, twice a day. And then the, oh, there's her osprey, he's got something. Looks like a flounder maybe. Hard to say. Like I said, everybody comes to eat at low tide. There is plenty of food here for all kinds of animals. Yeah, it looked like a flounder, the way the fin looked. Super cool to see. That's the advantage of having a nice big lens, <laughs> as you can see pretty well. Oh yeah, look at all those worms. They're hard to see. Let me scooch down low and see all the little things poking up. Those are all bamboo dew worms. Oh yeah, banded. Well, there's two different so, kinds. It's like a sneaky because the tube looks like bamboo, but then the worm with the sandy tube, the actual worm looks like bamboo. So common names, you know. Common names are the worst. As long as you know it's a tube worm. <laughs> yes. There is some other worm that's referred to as a bamboo yeah. tube worm that's not this one. Right. Yeah. yeah, it has like the sandy case. Yep. So funny. A few more people are coming out now to enjoy the beautiful low tide. Got looks like a lot of families out here. The, all the birds are out right now. The crows are just searching for all kinds of food. There's another heron over there. Uh, everybody's just munching and chowing down on things, which this is probably a good spot for us to kind of wrap up our beach walk here. Um, so if you have any last comments, you can pop them 
um, and we can try to answer them. Otherwise, I think we'll we'll kind of sign off here, say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and thanks to Jen of Seattle Aquarium for coming out with us and sharing a, a bit of her favorite beach. Yeah, we've been doing beach curtsies at each at each other, uh, which is so funny. <laughs> you know, it's. It's what we do. Yep, we're gonna keep learning, keep having fun. Um, we'll do our best to post this video on YouTube um, coming up soon so that we can, um, oh, a little crow drama over here. Somebody found something good and they're not gonna share. That always, why does that always happen to me? Every conclusion I'm doing, every, I should just make it a canned conclusion and just pop it in in the, uh, in the editing stage. <laughs> Yeah, that that is the secret. And if I just conclude long enough, we'll get orcas swimming by or <laughs> who knows. But there you have it, folks. Thanks for tuning in with us. We really appreciate um, all the love, all the shares, all the forwards, all the subscriptions and donations that you offer towards us. Um, helps us to continue to inspire stewardship of this amazing body of water. Um, but yeah, we're going to just keep keep exploring the beach and doing our, our natural thing. Uh, stay tuned for the next couple of days while we're out uh, on the beach learning more and more.